remember that I will be spaced out if you don't ask me questions. Okay? I have to. It's a necessity because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to keep going. So you have to ask three questions per lecture. Keep notes. Okay? <laughs> three questions. All right. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, give you an introduction to uh, what machine learning is. And actually, usually the introductory lectures are uh, more packed with ideas than many of the follow-up lectures, okay? Because I'm going to try to bring terminology and concepts that for some of you may be uh, new. So uh, again, it's an introduction. Uh, you don't need to understand uh, what everything is uh, all about. Now, if you do understand it, that's fantastic, all right? But obviously, each topic will come in a separate lecture. Okay. So actually, literally, I am going to be following, to some extent, uh, uh, Kevin Murphy's uh, uh, textbook, chapter one, for uh, what the lecture is today. So what's machine learning? All right, that uh, uh, means different things to different people. And that's why in many uh, good universities there are uh, 10 different machine learning courses offered by 10 different departments because everybody brings their own ideas and the way uh, they present things. And uh, so taking even the same course uh, from two different departments, if you're lucky to have that opportunity, it's always beneficial. So what is uh, machine learning, right? So in the context of computer science, when you program anything, in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, you will say to the computer, if this, do that, if this, do that. So you will try to list all possible actions that you want the computer to do, depending on what is going on. So machine learning is try actually uh, not to uh, require from the, the user to have an, explicit, uh, an explicitly programmed uh, list of commands on what to do. But uh, the, the idea here is to have a computer that is actually learning what it has to do, okay? So this is a statement written in 1959 uh, by Arthur Samuel. There was nothing actually related to machine learning at the time. But it says the following, machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed effectively on what to do. And the idea here is, uh, uh, obviously, the word learn is there. And the learning is going to happen by allowing the computer to experience what's going on through data. Okay? But the idea is not to program and say, if you see this, do that. If you see that, do that. This is the old way of thinking. Now, we don't know what to see. We let the computer decide. And it decides based on the data. And the more the data, the better. Now, when machine learning started, and the first book by Tom Mitchell was written in 1998 or so, he defined more formally what machine learning is. So I'm going to read the statement. It says, a computer program, it's said to learn from experience E, and you can think the word experience E means here data, with respect to some class of tasks T and some performance measure P. If the performance of tasks in T is measured by P, improves with experience C. So effectively, the more the data you provide, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the performance P on some tasks T gets better. And, and this is the nature of machine learning. The more the data, uh, the better it gets. Right? The question is, of course, uh, does it saturate in learning after a few data? If that happens, then something is not, is not very good, okay? And, and uh, uh, maybe for those who know a little bit about uh, deep learning, the idea of saturation there is natural. A lot of machine learning algorithms tend to saturate in performance way earlier than uh, deep learning type of algorithms. All right, so uh, that's the early thing. So obviously, uh, I don't have to tell you much on uh, uh, why uh, big data, the big data revolution and machine learning come together. Uh, the only thing I'm going to mention is that 
uh, the probabilistic approach to machine learning is, for me, it's essential. And I'm going to try to communicate this on uh, maybe the next two or three lectures. I am going to convince you that actually, unless you do probabilistic uh, approaches to machine learning, you can actually do get results that they are completely unreasonable. And let me just uh, mention uh, the most obvious fact where you need a probabilistic approach to machine learning. Everybody talks about big data. Now, if, I, if you have to train a machine learning algorithm with uh, small data and noisy data, you know, you're going to have to come back and tell me something about how confident you are in your predictions. It's not like, oh, this algorithm gives me uh, these answers. But you're going to have to say, you know what? Yeah, but the error bars are uh, plus minus 100 the mean value. And then you say, oops, that's not good. All right? So when you have a lot of data, we will see that the results actually converge to a delta function. Your predictions are perfect. But the less the data and the more noisy the data come, we will realize that we need to have error bars in the predictions. Okay? So I want you to think this being something extremely essential in many tasks because in uh, principle, uh, in many areas of science and engineering, big data don't exist. Okay? And uh, uh, as uh, big emphasis the reason on uh, big data, I can tell you that the last five years, very big initiatives for research in AI have to do with small data. Okay? You don't hear much about it uh, here, all right? but uh, I can tell you that uh, doing Bayesian machine learning is essential for this type of problems. Okay, uh, so let me define some standard problems, and, and for some, you may have seen this. For those, uh, all of these concepts will be new. Um, we will cover lots of very fine details, and uh, problems that uh, some of you may think are trivial, I am going to make them to look very complex because they can be very complex, okay? So, uh, so what I want to do is I want to first define uh, supervised learning. And um, so, you know, without reading anything, and somebody tells me uh, what's a supervised learning problem. Obviously, we're going to define supervised and unsupervised. So what's supervised learning? Just give me the most simple uh, type of a supervised learning problem. So can somebody tell me what's a regression problem? Have you heard the word regression? By the way, I was... Uh, uh, a few uh, weeks or months ago, I was at NSF and there was somebody. Uh, uh, these days, by the way, everybody's an expert on AI. Okay, so there was a proposal that used the word regression, and somebody said uh, this proposal is not worth it. You know, uh, regression was solved in the beginning of the century. Okay, now you have to think that uh, half of machine learning is regression, and this individual obviously had no clue about anything declared that regression was from last century, okay? So what's regression? Question one. Okay, great question. I think it's like a converge to the value or that is real. You know, the older you get, the less you hear. So uh, I, I cannot hear very well. Yeah. Maybe I should give you a microphone yeah. to amplify it. So the idea here of regression is, right, that I give you some inputs x, OK? And I give you the corresponding outputs. And you can think uh, uh, the outputs coming from some function of x, let's say f of x. <coughs> So I give you uh, the inputs x and the outputs y, and I give you n, n realizations of this. So I give you n points. Okay? And the idea of uh, a regression task or uh, 
as we call it here, a supervised learning, is to do some approximation and figure out what is the underlying function that takes me from x to y. All right, let's just make the key uh, ingredient of supervised learning. So the idea here is, I don't tell you what generates y, but there is some true function f, and we would like to, to uh, make some approximations to find out what that function is, okay? So this uh, set of points that I give you is called the training set. And uh, as we will emphasize throughout uh, uh, this course, uh, the objective is not to actually find a function that fits these points x i, y i perfectly, but to find a function that has some good predictive capability, which means if you give me some new x, you should be able to tell me with some confidence what the corresponding y is, right? And that's the test data set, okay? So remember, in, uh, for those who have uh, taken courses in numerical analysis, you take a course for a semester and you learn about interpolation. We're not talking about interpolation. Interpolation is not good for you, okay? Interpolation is not very good for you. So lots of the things, especially people in engineering teach you, are not very useful. Uh, if you want to be predictive, you have to go way beyond uh, 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 interpolation. Okay, so a supervised learning problem is a problem where I give you X and the corresponding labels Y, all right? That's why we call it supervised. We provide the outputs corresponding to each X. Now, why is this not a new problem? Uh, uh, obviously, people are solving fitting functions from hundreds of years, but what is making this problem a very interesting uh, problem is, what about if the input X is very high dimensional? Do we actually know how to do it? So for example, if you have an input x that's a vector that is a thousand dimensional, can we actually do it? A lot of the techniques that they're out in textbooks will not work. And you may say, do we have actually a thousand dimensional input? Of course we do. We may have a million dimensional input. So, uh, so that's a challenge, okay? Um, now, the output for this uh, supervised learning problems can be a scalar uh, or a vector of, of uh, real numbers, okay? But let's say that uh, it can be, um, uh, you know, real number, scalar, so that's a typical uh, regression problem. But also it can be a categorical uh, variable, and a categorical variable means can take the values, let's say, uh, male, female, you know, um, tall, short, or something like that, right? So this, as you can imagine, will correspond to type of classification problems, not regression problems, right? So classification problems, they are supervised learning problems, but the difference is for each x, you provide the category that that x belongs to. So if x, you know, is uh, some input, you know, y can be, this is male, you know, for that other X corresponds to a female, etc. And of course, the, the prediction that you're interested in is, if I give you an arbitrary X to tell me if what you have is a male or a female, okay? So let's say the, the output's a categorical variable, and, um, and we will use this in the context of um, uh, classification problems. And uh, you have other versions of this type of algorithms, uh, including what is called here an ordinal regression, where the label space where Y belongs has some natural ordering. So the way, for example, you assign grades, you know grades are gonna go from A to F. So it sounds like uh, a regression problem, but uh, it is a mix really. Uh, it's an extension of this uh, categorical um, uh, variables that we discussed earlier. Okay, unsupervised learning now. Uh, and this is a problem most probably lots of you don't have much appreciation because you have never used it in uh, uh, your research. But it is most probably as essential as the other 50% of the challenges in machine learning. So what I do is here is I give you some uh, points X, uh, which again can be high dimensional. And I don't give you the corresponding Y's. So what I want you to do is, if I give you X's, I want you to go and discover some patterns in the data. 
And what do I mean patterns? For example, this uh, point X must be coming from some unknown distribution. Can you find what distribution produces the point X? I mean, if it's a Gaussian, can you find what the mean of the variance is? And if it is not a Gaussian, it's some, some alta variant distribution, how do you do that? So this problem of density estimation uh, goes hand to hand with what is called generative model, right? You want, can you generate other X's that come from the same distribution where the training data are coming from, okay? Um, so this is some supervised learning problem. Now, uh, there is a, a third category. Actually, there are many categories, but the third category, in addition to supervised and unsupervised learning, is what's called reinforcement learning. Um, I know if I offer a course on this, and I'm very excited, actually, for scientific reasons on this topic, I'm going to have minus 10 students attending. Okay? Even though it's in a very hot area with lots of applications uh, everywhere. Okay? So, in reinforcement learning, you, you have obviously the inputs X. You don't have any outputs Y, all right? However, what you have is you have some rewards uh, to the actions that you take from the environment. So for example, if you think of uh, playing a computer game, the rewards will be if you do the right move, uh, maybe you win and you get some money, all right? Uh, so, uh, so the type of output you have, it's indirect in the context of an award that you receive to every action you get. So you can think of this as a schematic like this, where that's you uh, playing a computer game. Uh, you're taking different actions. Uh, you're changing the environment as you do different actions. And then uh, the environment rewards you, and that's the signal you get back. It's not why, it's not the output of anything like that. It's the reward, and, and obviously these problems, the objective is, can you maximize the rewards that you get as you play the game, okay? Now, lots of these ideas people have, of course, used for computer uh, games development, but I can tell you it's only in the last uh, two or three years, people have recognized that this type of problems can have extreme uh, importance to lots of problems in science and engineering, okay? And the number of people working on this is zero, okay? Because lots of people in those domains don't know anything about reinforcement learning, but this is an excellent uh, area for somebody to work on. Okay, uh, so let me um, uh, give you a problem of uh, supervised learning in the context of uh, classification. So we, I, I am giving you some um, uh, input X, all right? So I have a training data set, X1, X2, etc. And I, let's say my objective is to figure out, uh, uh, I want to cluster the data, the different classes, right? So I am telling you that point X1 corresponds to class one, point X2 to class two, etc. And I want you to be able to learn uh, an arbitrary point X to what class it belongs. Now, if C equal to 2, this is a binary classification. C greater than uh, 3 is a multi-class classification. You can have what is called a multi-label classification, where you actually, maybe your output is two class labels if the two classes don't uh, object each other. So you can say, in this particular case, uh, maybe uh, short tall is one class, classification, task, and another one is strong, weak, right? So you can actually say somebody is tall and strong. So this is a multi-label classification problem. The word that I use that I want you to remember is generalization. So what does generalization mean in general? So in all the of machine learning, when I say I want to, to be able to generalize, what does that mean? Remember, we're not interested to interpolate. So generalize means? I want you to learn the word because it's going to be coming all the time. So when we say we want to be able to generalize, what does that mean? If we have new data, we can still predict the 
Yeah, so for data that we have not seen before, we, for data that we have not used to train our algorithm, we need to be able to have a good predictive capability. We need to be able to say a new context to what class it belongs. Okay? Um, now, let me give you an example, and um, uh, this is from an original paper pointing to issues with uh, classification algorithms. Let me just say that uh, I give you these different shapes with different colors, and somehow, so this box is, contains uh, data that I provide to the label. So this is the training data. So for these shapes, I tell you it's class one. You don't really need to know what class one means. I'm just I have something in my head, and I say all of the shapes are class one, okay, and all of the shapes are class uh, zero. So the task is now if I give you some new shapes and colors that you see on the bottom to figure out for me if this is class one or class zero. So uh, this is what generalization is. And, and, uh, and uh, let me just introduce them a little bit of terminology. Uh, so this is obviously the training data set okay, that contains both the shapes and the labels. This is my uh, uh, test data set. And the metrics that you see here is what is called a design matrix. So I want you to look at it and tell me uh, what does the design matrix uh, contain, what type of information, because this is the starting point of every machine learning algorithm. So what is this matrix? Look, so these are my training data set, right? And so this whole thing here is my design matrix. I'm concentrating on the input now, but you know the corresponding output is given uh, on the right hand side. So what, uh, uh, what its row uh, what each row of this matrix contains. So if I look at this row, what does it contain? Color, shape, and size. Say it again? Color, shape, and size. Yeah, so it contains the input futures. All right, obviously here it's the uh, input is not one dimensional because it contains the color, the shape, the size, etc. All right? So each row, it's one data point, all right? And each column corresponds to a different future of the input. This is what we call the design matrix. So every algorithm that you will be using will actually be based on uh, uh, organizing your input um, in a nice matrix like this that looks uh, easy now uh, for low dimensional inputs, but it can be very high dimensional. Okay, now, uh, in the context of classification, we're interested to do probabilistic predictions. And the question is, what does probabilistic prediction mean? I am going to throw you now lots of ideas that uh, we will elaborate, but I do anticipate that you already know these things in some way. So we need to be able, uh, so let me define some notation. This calligraphic D is my training data. And training data, because this is a supervised learning problem, is, for example, the shapes and colors and the labels, all right? So D contains my training data. So once I train my algorithm, I would like to do predictions for an arbitrary X that the system has not seen before. And I would like to predict this probability distribution, which is the probability of Y of the label given X and given D. There's a lot of information there, right? So the idea is you would like to predict for every given x the probability of y, but also given the training data, because you already have seen this. So how do we call this uh, probability distribution given the data set D? What's the name that goes with it? The posterior, all right? So the idea here is we would like to, uh, to produce the posterior predictive distribution, okay? And, and I say posterior predictive because in essence, posterior lots of times refers to the posterior of the parameters to the model. So really there are no parameters the way it is written there. It is the posterior predictive distribution for a given x. I would like to know what's the probability of y given my data set D. 
Now, uh, if you don't want to be fully probabilistic and you want to figure out uh, a given x to what class it belongs, what you actually can do, you can calculate all of these posterior distributions for y taking different uh, uh, class labels, so for y equal to 1, y equal to 2, and then assign to point x uh, the class that maximizes this posterior predictive distribution. Okay? L look at that equation carefully and, and get a sense, you know, that makes some, you know, uh, makes a logical sense, right? If you want to assign one class only, you will calculate all of these posterior predictive distributions and figure out for what C this is maximized, then say, you know what? I am going now to assign to X the label uh, that maximizes this posterior, and this is the argument that you see here. And how do we call this in statistics, that point estimate? How do you call that uh, point estimate in statistics? So you have a posterior, a predicted distribution, and then you find the maximum of it. And you take that as your point estimate. How do we call that? Maximum, uh, posterior. It's the map estimate, the maximum posteriori estimate. Okay, so that's the map estimate. Now, uh, I will say that uh, uh, I don't know what percentage, but a significant percentage in Murphy's book, it operates with a, a map estimate for many algorithms because obviously it's faster. Uh, easier to operate and it assumes that if you have a lots of data this is a very good estimate but I am going to show you that uh, maybe two or three lectures that using the map estimate to actually do predictions it's bad for you okay now sometimes you know things that they're bad for you it doesn't mean you don't use them because you have to use something right but you need to be aware when things actually are not going to work and they're not sensible Okay, and certainly, uh, if you do predictions using the map estimate that you use, you see there, I would not say by any means that you are probabilistic. So, in other ways, this type of estimates you can easily pose them as an optimization problem. You don't really need probability theory. Okay, so uh, uh, again, if you have lots of data, these are very good estimates. If you don't have lots of data, uh, you will get in trouble. Okay. So actually a lot of the uh, commercial algorithms that uh, uh, Google is using, uh, they are fully probabilistic, okay? Uh, but then again, since they are using a lot of data to train the system, uh, the uh, you know, point estimates will work uh, as well, so uh, so for example, one of the systems I see here on the last bullet, you know, when uh, uh, you know when uh, you try you buy different things on Amazon.com, for example, uh, they already know what you like, and actually they have a system that has assigned a, pro a predictive distribution, if you like, for any new item, so they know what is the probability that you may buy a Mercedes version BMW. So they bombard you constantly. They say, this is a good customer. Keep sending him information that this is the car he needs, OK? Uh, so these algorithms are probabilistic in nature, right? And, and we will uh, visit some of those uh, as we move along. All right, so this is um, uh, in, uh, an example from natural language uh, uh, processing to tell you that the same algorithms, you can actually generalize them. and. Um, so, you know what is uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, wonderful picture that you see that has, uh, it's obviously a pixelized uh, representation of an image that is a thousand uh, dimensional by 100. It's actually the design metrics of, uh, of language. All right? So can you actually guess? So uh, let me just describe you the background, and then you can tell me what this picture, what this thing shows, OK? So uh, 
I consider different sentences, right, from a textbook, for example, right? So I take your machine learning from different chapters and I uh, uh, cut different sentences. And the, the vertical axis uh, corresponds to different words. So, for example, you know, some words can be classification, regression, Bayesian, predictive, you know, different type of things, okay? Support, vector, machines, you know, etc. So, the vertical axis are words, and the horizontal axis correspond to sentences. So, this is a representation of, a, of uh, sentences, of language, basically. And uh, the scheme that you see here is the easiest that you can have that is called the bag of words representation. So if you take a, cer a, a certain sentence, uh, when do you see black and when do you see white? Remember, the vertical axis are different words. So if I take a sentence for a given word, when do I put in the intersection black or white? if the, that particular word appears in the sentence or not, okay? That's why we have a sort of a binary representation. So for a given word, uh, sentence i uh, and, and a word j, x i j is equal to one if the word j is, is in that sentence. So what you actually have is a compact way to represent all of the sentences uh, together. And really, you know what this is? This is your design metrics. You remember the design metrics? Right? That's the design metrics. Okay? Now, what do you do with the design metrics in the context of uh, uh, you know, natural language processing? For example, you may decide, okay, I have all of the sentences coming from different textbooks, etc. Can I figure out uh, uh, how to separate these different documents in different classes? Maybe one document is about support vector machines, another document is about deep learning, another document is uh, about probabilistic graphical models. How do I separate? And obviously, you can see, so these three lines that you see there separate these particular documents because you can see uh, in some of these documents, certain patterns, right? Lots of specific words are missing, okay? so. Uh, so you can do classification of text using this type of uh, 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 bag of words representation, which is the simplest model. But obviously, uh, things can get more complicated than this. But we will literally do one example like that uh, later on. And you will see that uh, it's only a matter of uh, uh, five lines of programming to actually uh, being able to analyze something like this. OK. Um, now, this is a standard uh, example. Literally, it's a benchmark problem uh, for testing classification algorithms. And in this case, uh, you basically are trying to uh, classify uh, uh, fl uh, flowers in, in, uh, in uh, different classes. And if I can see how many, we have basically three different types of flowers. Okay? And uh, so we provide some training data. And then, you know, we would like, you know, somebody comes with a new flower and says, can you tell me uh, what is the probability that this flower A or flower B or flower C? And uh, this particular uh, example, and actually this comes out from uh, Bishop's book as well. It's sort of in every uh, machine learning book, this example is the standard that you need to test your algorithm. But the idea that uh, they use originally was Rather than do classification using the images directly, uh, what originally was done was to extract some futures from these images, all right? To extract some low dimension of futures from these images and use those futures to do the classification. And uh, in this particular case, the futures they extracted are uh, what is called the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, and the petal width. And somehow, they have shown that if you use these four futures, you can identify any of these three flowers. All right? Now, uh, you can actually, if you study this carefully, you will see uh, this is one particular flower. 
and you can immediately see that uh, if you uh, look at the petal length or petal width, uh, somehow there is, you know, the values of uh, uh, for this particular flower are very low, right? So immediately you can see uh, uh, when uh, uh, you look at all possible values of the petal length and petal width, the ones that are the lowest are this particular flower corresponding to red here. And I don't know what the name of the flower is, but uh, uh, these are the setosas, okay? Now, generally speaking, there are challenges here. Because if somebody tells you, go and extract some futures and, yet, and then use those futures uh, to do classification, you may ask, do I have to do this manually? Do I need to know the details of the particular problem, know something about flowers and what is important? In this case, they did. In more complicated problems, you will actually not be able to extract these futures on your own, and you need to let the computer figure out what futures may be necessary to do the classification process. Okay? So, uh, again, this may sound uh, an easy problem because these futures were done as, as pre-processing operation, but in general, uh, you will not be able to do them. All right, so here is uh, uh, another benchmark uh, type of problem for classification. Um, this is from the uh, uh, I'm assuming from the MNIST um, uh, digits data set. Um, so you have a uh, lots of handwritten digits. Um, I give you some training data. I tell you, for example, uh, the true class for this is seven, the true class for this is two, the true class for that is one. And then I just write down any digit and I tell you, go and tell me what number is that. Now we will uh, see uh, when uh, we deal with this type of problems that actually uh, there are algorithms that are able to do the classification for images for these numbers um, without actually exploring um, any correlations in the image. And what I mean with that is they take this pixelized version of uh, these numbers and they put them in a very long vector. Okay? Without saying that if I have a black here pixel, the chances that the next pixel will be black is higher, right? They don't do any of that. So as a matter of fact, these algorithms will work as well if you use the images that you see on the left or the images that you use on the right. Now, trust me, this image, for example, here is the image of seven. What have I done to get this picture from there? Can you guess? What have I done to the seven to go from uh, this picture to this picture? Remember, the, the uh, neighborhood information in this algorithm, it doesn't come to play at all. So what have I done uh, to demonstrate that actually you can get the same answers? What I have done is, I randomly perturb the locations of the pixels from the images in the left to the images in the right. And because there is no correlation information that comes in the representations, these algorithms give you the same number. So effectively, you look at this, you don't see a two, but it's actually two, where the pixels have been randomly uh, uh, moved around, okay? So obviously, the ideal algorithms for doing this type of problems would be algorithms that uh, uh, you know, use some uh, domain-specific knowledge to correlate the pixels. Uh, and obviously, those algorithms will be way more powerful, but more complicated to work with. Okay, so we will discuss about those uh, uh, later uh, uh, when we talk about a little bit about random fields and, and uh, uh, how to do Bayesian inference on these problems. Okay. Now, um, uh, phase recognition from those, uh, uh, from computer science, you know, when uh, you take your phone and you take pictures, right, one of the things that it does when it zooms, it recognizes all the faces, okay? So it basically sort of uses a moving window representation, and when it finds a face, it stops, okay? So it doesn't 
uh, extract any features of the face. It doesn't tell you if it is a man or a woman, all right? It tells you there is a human being there, all right? And that's um, uh, the face recognition task. And the same thing is used in uh, the Street View application of Google. So when they want to actually um, move the faces of the people out so they don't start suing Google, all right? So they locate the faces and then they mark them out so you don't see them, okay? Even though I, lo I heard a lot of horror stories uh, of Google postings with, uh, um, um, you know, the private lives of people, you know, across the windows. Okay. Uh, regression. So we are going back to the supervised learning problem. And uh, can you look at this picture and tell me what the task is? I have to tell you, uh, when we cover regression, it brings up all the complexity and all the machinery of machine learning. So if you actually understand by the end of the semester on how to do uh, regression problems in high dimensions, you understand everything. Because everything comes and uh, it demonstrates how easy and how difficult things can be. Okay? so. What do you see in this picture? What is the regression task here? So what are the blue points? That's my training data, right? So I give you uh, the, some uh, uh, location sex, right, and the corresponding y. Now, some function generates these uh, blue points, which we don't know, and as we said, the objective is to uh, recognize what that function is, okay? And um, if somehow you approximate that function with a straight line, you get something like this. If you approximate with parabola, you get something like that. And if you approximate with a uh, polynomial of degree 20, you actually fit all the data perfectly. <coughs> so when you look at this, uh, what answer do you like? Second. Which one? The second one, uh, I'm guessing the second one, most probably will, it's, uh, will be better, okay? Uh, the fitting here doesn't look very good. There, there is way too much overfitting, okay? So this looks a little bit more uh, reasonable. And uh, this is the type of a plot that you have to do to figure out how to do model selection. So I want you to look I don't care about specifics here. I want you to look at the picture and tell me what does potentially plot. All right, I see the word train, and then I, I see the word test. What does this picture do? What am I plotting there? I mean, let's concentrate on, on uh, these blue squares. Uh, obviously, it's some sort of an error, all right? And it is the mean square error. Uh, for what data? For the training data. So what is this plot for the blue square says? Yeah, so the higher the order of polynomial, the more complex the fitting, the less the training error. And uh, if you take a class, you know, um, uh, still, and I'm talking in 2020, um, in uh, numerical methods, they will tell you, minimize the error, all right? Yeah, I minimize the error, and this is what I get. I fit everything perfectly. But in reality, because all of these points, uh, potentially they are noisy points, uh, what you're doing, you're not fitting the real function, you're fitting the noise implied by the data, okay? So that's not good for you. Now, how do you know then that this is not good? Because you know it, because if I give you another data set, uh, that's my test data set that the system has never seen, um, and I compute the error that I do for the test data set, what do you see suddenly? And I don't know if this is an ideal plot. You can see that um, the you can see that the error, like the training error, goes down. All right, then it stabilizes. But then as the order of polynomial increases, 
the joint one point, the test error blows up. All right? The test error blows up. So we're going to use these ideas, and, and uh, uh, you will see that uh, the Bayesian formalism is the only means that I know that allows you to do model selection. All right? It is the only way that I know that you can do model selection in a rigorous manner. You can do a lot of uh, sort of empirical other methodologies to do model selection, but the Bayesian way is the best way that will allow us to actually resolve this problem and figure out what is the best model. And I can tell you the, uh, the answer to the, the, the Bayesian uh, way is that the best model is the simplest model. Okay, so the simplest model that explains the data is the best model. That's the Occam's razor problem, right? So the simplest model is, is the, uh, the best model. But obviously, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, it's not like you're gonna say, oh, the order of polynomials uh, is two. Uh, well, it depends on what data you have and how much data you have. So we will see these details uh, uh, when we talk about the regression. All right, so let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the difference uh, from probabilistic point of view between uh, supervised and unsupervised learning problem. So you remember in a supervised learning problem, I give you the uh, x's and the corresponding y's, all right? Uh, so in a supervised learning problem, if I call theta the parameters that you have in your model, uh, and again, you know, we will not elaborate more on this, can be the regression coefficients or something like that. But in, um, in supervised learning, uh, what actually you are learning is this condition and distribution that you see here. You're learning basically what's the probability of y given an x for your particular model. And it happens uh, that, um, so for example, here in a classification problem, you're learning what's the probability that you have class one for the given x or class uh, zero, okay? This distribution can be actually represented with very simple uh, univariate distribution. So you can actually, let's say, represent this as a Gaussian. All right, so because the condition and distribution this distribution is an easy distribution to represent, okay? However, in unsupervised learning, you don't have y's, and actually what you're trying to learn is the probability of x. And that probability of x uh, can actually, uh, cannot come from a simple distribution. It has to come from a multivariate distribution, all right? Imagine if I give you data that are coming from this class and that class and the other class, right? And I throw all of this data to you. Uh, don't expect that the simple Gaussian generates all this data from five different classes. Literally, it will be sort of a mixture of Gaussians, okay? Uh, so, uh, unsupervised learning, it's a little bit trickier than supervised learning, okay? Because the type of distributions that you have to deal with would be multivariate, okay? And um, um, uh, I am going to talk, if we have time today, a little bit about the hidden variables in uh, representing um, uh, this type of unsupervised learning problems, right? But, you know, uh, obviously, when I tell you, here are all the data that uh, are coming from different classes, and I don't tell you what classes they are, okay? There must be some variables that somehow say, you know what? This data point comes from the yellow class. This comes from the red class. This comes from the black class. But I don't give you that information. So effectively, it's like you will need to figure out what those hidden variables are, but somehow integrate them out because that information is not there. Okay? And, and uh, so this will be a significant uh, part of our course because it's an essential task everywhere in machine learning. So we're going to cover uh, those topics uh, in uh, different settings as we go along. All right, so here I mentioned um, 
so I'm, I'm throwing to you this data, all right? And there are data of, let's say, uh, weight and height of uh, different people. So I want you to look on the picture on uh, the left, okay? On the top left. What information do I give for this data? I mean, it's the way that I see it, it's all blue. It means I don't tell you uh, if it is women, men, uh, Asian versus uh, uh, Europeans or whatever. It's all together, okay? Now, uh, what have I done there is I actually separated the data in two classes, right? You can see two different classes. And here, I have separated in three classes. So when actually I give you this plot with uh, colors, is I have identified what is hidden labels of the data. So the difficulty that we have to deal is, is for us to only have this sort of data and then somehow try to identify what are the underlying classes uh, to which this data belong to. No other information, I just throw you the data and I tell you, can you tell me that somehow there are three different classes uh, in this data, okay? Um, so we will see how that is, is um, and obviously um, there are lots of issues here uh, because uh, somebody can say, now here I say you separated the data in two classes, here in three. How do you know it's two and three? I mean, if, I, if you only give me this blue data, how do I know how many classes do I have in that data? Well, what we will need to do is we will need to produce a posterior of the number of classes given my training data D, and then somehow take a point estimate of that and figure out what is the K that maximizes that posterior. All right, so it sounds like being able to use a posterior distribution there to do a model selection for the model refers to how many uh, classes, but uh, even in that case, if I tell you I have two classes, how do you know which points are this color and which points are those are that color? And the, actually the answer, uh, 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 somehow it's hidden in, uh, in this information. Can you look at this equation and tell me how am I going to be making a decision for a new test point X to what color that point belongs to? What does it say I need to do? Look at that equation. You know, there's no equations really symbolic here, but what does, what, you know, what color do I assign to a point Xi? Let's say that my point Xi is a point, you know, there, you know. So what color should I assign based on that equation. What does it say I need to do? What is this calculation? No. What is Z? Latent variable. It's the latent variable. Is the hidden color of that point. Right? It's the hidden color. So what I'm doing is, once I have my training data D, I produce a predictive distribution that tells me what's the probability that the color, let's say, is blue for this point X given my training data. And then obviously, if I compute this for all different colors that I have, I am going to assign X to the color that maximizes this uh, map estimate. Okay? So I am going to assign X to uh, the color that maximizes um, uh, that maximizes this uh, posterior predictive distribution. All right. Um, let me talk another uh, application that I know for people in, uh, certainly in engineering, is a sort of uh, uh, a standard uh, uh, thing that they need to, to use in sort of any part of numerical work. Uh, and that has to do with dimensionality reduction. So if somebody gives you the data that they are thousand dimensional, the question always is, do I really need thousand dimensions? Right? Can I live maybe with ten dimensions? All right. And um, now there is the bad news and the very good news with uh, these dimensionality reduction methods. 
sorry, the, the, the old news at least, uh, you know, that people in science and engineering have uh, used, and in computer vision as well for, uh, you know, 50 years now, is to really think of uh, dimensionality reduction as projecting data from some high dimensional space to some uh, low dimensional manifold embedded in high dimensions. So in this case, for example, uh, you can see these blue points, they are nearly close to a, a, a plane, so effectively a two-dimensional representation of this 3D data would be projecting these points on the plane that you see here. This is the idea of principal component analysis, and these are the principal directions as we will see later in the course. And if you want to actually project the data only in one dimension, you can actually project them on this line. Now, this is the old way of thinking of dimensionality reduction as projecting data to a low dimensional manifold. Uh, the new way of thinking about dimensionality reduction is, is uh, very much in line with ideas from generative modeling. Okay? So really, uh, you're not looking uh, in projecting, let's say in this case, the data to two dimensions, but you're looking in building a map from two dimensions to three dimensions. So remember, the projection takes you from three dimensions to two. That's the old way of thinking. The generative way of thinking is, you know what? I'm going to be sampling in two dimensions, right? because it's easy. And then I'm going to be using some mapping from two dimensions to three dimensions. OK? So these generative ways for thinking of uh, I don't even call it model reduction, right? Uh, the only model, the concept of model reduction comes because uh, you are doing a lots of algebra in low dimensional space, but you still remain in high dimensions. Because that's where the physics is. That's where the substance of your problem is. Okay? Uh, now, the good news are that these generative methods don't lose any of the information of the old techniques like PCA, for example, or probabilistic PCA. They contain Everything we used to know, but they're way more powerful uh, because they can generate data. So these methods cannot generate data. They take your data, they project them, and that's it. So if you want to visualize data in 2D, you project them in 2D, done. Now, uh, if you want to say, can you actually generate me more data like this from the same distribution, PCA will not help you. But the generative models will actually be able to do that. OK? So we actually have to talk about dimensionality reduction in this generative way. And obviously, uh, you'd be surprised that the typical uh, PCA type algorithm, it's about 10 lines. Right? It's literally 10 lines of a computer program to do this. And um, uh, the first application, and there are books on this uh, in computer vision, is to actually uh, use it to compress information on images. And you can see here, if you train uh, PCA with uh, uh, all of these uh, pixelized images, uh, and then you project uh, these high dimension images to uh, uh, one, two, and three dimensions, you can actually see that, uh, literally, if you actually zoom in, uh, this is a particular guy, right, that uh, you can see on the pixel below there. You can actually see that, uh, can you see that the glasses of the guy are coming up here, right? Can you see it or it's just me? Actually, if you take a step backwards, you can see that if you use a projection of the data in 10 dimensions, sorry, and you do reconstruction in 10 dimensions, you can actually see the glass of the guy coming. Now, in this particular case, it's a tougher problem you're going to have to use 400 latent variables to be able to generate the picture. But in most cases, in computer vision, you're actually doing this with uh, projecting in two and three variables. Actually, in computer vision, I have seen papers published with projection literally in two dimensions. When you look even in uh, Bishop's uh, uh, textbook, uh, the examples, the state of the art uh, a few years, maybe 10, 15 years ago, was literally being able to do visualization of data in two dimensions. And uh, uh, people were happy. But now, with the generative models, the paradigm has changed. 
So let me uh, uh, summarize the idea here is, let's say if Y is the high dimensional data, like a pixelized version of these images, uh, a generative model, what it does, it learns a mapping from some low dimensional space to Y, right? And the projection, the way that PCA works, that's the opposite. It actually takes the high dimensional data Y and projects them into some latent space Z. Now, uh, people always, when they do PCA, they say, what is the proper dimensionality of C? We will actually see when you do a generative modeling, uh, the actual dimensionality of Z is not that important. Okay? So basically, you say, I want to be able to build the mapping from uh, a low dimensional Z to Y, but how low dimensional Z is is unimportant because Z is going to come to be, uh, let's say, a Gaussian random variable. So if it's a three-dimensional, or 50-dimensional, or 500-dimensional, it doesn't matter. The calculation will not be very expensive because the distribution of Z is going to be uh, 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 a simple distribution to work. Um, another application, and this has uh, uh, lots of uh, relevance in uh, chemistry and biology, etc. You know, if I give you uh, a set of uh, uh, variables, right, and uh, I give you realizations of these variables, I pose the following problem. Can you tell me what variables correlate with what variables? So you can think of this as a graph representation problem where you have all of these variables together, and the correlations mean do I have a link from this variable to that variable? So the only information that I give you are realizations of these variables, and you have to figure out what correlates with what. So this problem is posed uh, as a graph structure learning problem. And in the probabilistic graphical model course, I think there must be a lecture post on my website. You can find a lot of information on this problem. But it's essential because you know when somebody throws you uh, high dimensional input data, Really, you have no idea of the correlations implied in that data, so you can actually pose this problem uh, as learning the structure of the graph. So you're asking literally, uh, okay, I can start with this variable being correlated to everything. Then you throw your data and you say, this is not correlated to this, there's no link. It's not correlated to that, and this is what you need. So you get a sparse correlation profile which would be essential to actually do subsequent analysis. Um, I need to keep track of, uh, we have three minutes left. So, um, a lot of applications in uh, uh, what's called this uh, matrix completion problem. So if somebody gives you an image, I'm actually, let me ge even generalize since we already discussed about the design metrics. Suppose that I give you a problem where in the design matrix you have gaps, right? So you remember the design matrix is one data point, different input uh, futures, right? You know, for some data points, you don't have any information for those futures, okay? So there are gaps actually in your design matrix. Uh, how do you actually do predictions when uh, uh, your design uh, matrix has missing information? This can come, for example, uh, in images. I give you a, an image, and maybe a third of the image is missing. Right? If you're trying to reconstruct a Van Gogh image, and somehow his head, the head of a, somebody painted there was not there. It's like a design matrix with missing information. How do you actually fill that information? And we will see the idea here is to use some prior knowledge on how pixels are correlated right in the image. And, and that way, try to use the values that we know uh, to fill the gaps that we don't know. So this has applications in, uh, in multiple uh, areas, OK? Uh, and it's really all related to this fundamental problem that is called matrix completion. I'm actually going to show you this problem and maybe give you a homework problem uh, where I'm going to have uh, data generated from a high dimensional Gaussian which I will not tell you what it is, and I'm going to ask you go, to go and compute what that Gaussian is, right? So there will be missing 
information, and you will see uh, that somehow, uh, even though let's say 40% of the image is missing, or you know the design metrics is missing, you'll actually be able to solve this problem. It's like think that you're do doing experiments for your advisor, and somehow you forgot to turn your measurement device on, all right? And you say, what do I do now? I wasted months. Don't tell him anything. Go and do metrics completion. And then you say, here is all the information. This is all the data I need, right? And it works, OK? But you need to do some appropriate regularization, as we will see. Um, I am going to finish with uh, this slide for today. Uh, in, uh, we will see that the methods that we will use in machine learning following two other categories. One of them is what's called a parametric um, um, modeling approach. So think of parametric, you know, so we're going to have to learn distributions, right? So in these parametric models, we're going to assume some particular distribution with some parameters. Let's say a Gaussian with a known mean and variance. Those are the parametric models. Now, the non-parametric models, the number of parameters grows with the amount of the training data. So they don't have fixed parameters. Uh, so if your, as your data goes to infinity, the number of parameters will actually go to infinity. These non-parametric methods are way more complicated, but actually they're way more relevant to research these days. Okay? So we're going to have to cover a few things about non-parametric methods uh, in this course. So we were discussing about the concept of uh, parametric model. All right, so a parametric model is a model that has a fixed number of parameters. And I would say half of the course is going to be about parametric models. Actually, most probably more than half, OK? So you can think a model, you know, you fit data to a polynomial of certain order with so many coefficients. That's a parametric model. Or you fit a distribution to have the form of a Gaussian. That's a parametric model, OK? So it doesn't matter how much data you have, the number of parameters is fixed in that model. Uh, we will actually talk about models that have adaptable parameters, so we will actually push this idea a little bit further. But for now, parametric model is a model that has a fixed number of parameters. And non-parametric model is a model where the number of parameters increases with the data set size. OK? So, uh, Obviously, this is a much more uh, powerful approach to lots of problems, but you can imagine uh, if you work with non-parametric models, the degree of difficulty uh, for the algorithms and methodologies will go uh, up significantly. But research-wise, non-parametric models are very much relevant. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give you examples uh, of a non-parametric model and then an example uh, in integration and classification for parametric models. All of this we will cover them later on with more than one lecture per topic. Okay? So if you don't understand, it's all right. I just want to give you a flavor of what these problems are all about. All right, so the, uh, uh, the first non parametric model that I will be discussing or that you will see is what is called the K nearest neighbor classifier. Any of you know of what this is all about? Sort of, it's one of the simplest algorithms in machine learning. So, I mean, you can see here, I have obviously data points of two different colors, so I have two classes, all right? So the idea, uh, we're gonna be using this algorithm for classification. So if somehow you give me a point anywhere, I will need to tell you what's the probability of being in the red class versus I don't know what the other color is, uh, green class. So, so how do you think the algorithm works? And I give you an equation that you see on the middle. So look carefully at the equation. It says, if you have a training set D, all right, those are my data points that you see here. Uh, and you want to actually predict that the probability that uh, a point X belongs to class C that is given by this nice formula. So I want you to look at it and tell me what the formula says using, you know, trying to extrapolate from the name K nearest neighbor. So look at this formula. 
this is the indicator function. And nk, x comma d, is the neighborhood of x that contains k points from the data set d. So with words, what does this algorithm do? Looking at that equation. So if you want to decide if a point is in class C, what do you do? You should be able to read the questions because uh, doing the opposite, starting with you writing the equation as part of the model would be much more difficult. If I give you the equation, you should be able to interpret what the algorithm is. So what is the algorithm? What does it say you need to do to figure out the probability that x is in class C? Let's say that a given point is in the red class. It says look at the k neighbors of that point and then do what? Count the percentage of points, let's say, that they are red points. Right? Uh, you need to get familiar with the indicator function. So the indicator function says uh, if the data point i uh, is in class C, so this indicator function is equal to 1 when yi equal to C, then you count 1. All right? So uh, if you count all the points that are in the class C divided by k, is the percentage of the points in the neighborhood that includes k neighbors. Uh, that are in class C. All right, so this is what uh, the uh, k-nearest neighbor classifier uh, looks like. Now, if you look at that picture, can you tell me what part of the algorithm is that picture uh, about? How many neighbors does the, the algorithm works on uh, based on that picture? I mean, this is a very particular uh, uh, you know, case of the algorithm. So what is that case? Is that k equals to 1? k equal to 1. And how do we call the geometric design that you see here that has a very particular interpretation that we will do at another day? How do we call that? Voronoi tessellation, okay? So effectively, if you, you notice that every region contains only one point, which means every point in this region, let's say, will be the green point. Every point in that region will be in the red class. Every point in that region will be the red class. So effectively, the nearest point, if you take any of these regions, the, uh, you know, the nearest data point from the training data set is this point inside that region, okay? So let me ask you the following, if you understand this idea of uh, k equal to 1 and the Voronoi tessellation. If you use k equal to 1 and you compute the misclassification error you're doing the training data set, can you tell me how much that error is? So let me repeat. If I ask you, so if you use this particular case for k equal to 1, and I ask you to compute how much misclassification error you do on the training data set, on these points that you see there, how much that error you think is? Zero. Zero. But if k equal to 2 or k equal to 3, you are going to be doing an error even in the training data set. Can you see that? Because if I take, let's say, a, a point here that is uh, green, or let's take this point, and then say, I'm going to take the five nearest neighbors. If you take five nearest neighbors, you notice they're all green. So you're going to make this point to be a green point, even though it's a red point. So k equal to 1 uh, makes the model very complex, and it gives you an error. Uh, it makes it very complex because you know, you're trying to fit things uh, uh, precisely, but in the process, you're actually misclassifying even the training data set. All right, so that's the Voronoi tessellation, and that's the k nearest neighbor classifier. Let me ask the following actually Why is this model a non parametric model? 
Remember the parametric model has a fixed number of parameters independent of the data set. A parametric model, in principle, what the definition I used was uh, that the number of parameters grows with data. Do I have any parameters, sort of, uh, uh, when I write this equation? That's my algorithm. Do I have any parameters? To decide if a point X is in the class C, what do you do? You look at the neighborhood. So you look at the data points. So effectively, these data points, the training data, are like parameters. If I have more data, I will have another algorithm, another model. Right, because the uh, K neighborhood changes. And if I have infinite data sets, obviously the number of effective parameters would be infinite. Right, because when I say, look how many uh, neighbors are in class C, obviously that depends on the amount of data that I have and the type of data I have. The more the data, the more of those. Okay, so this is sort of the easiest uh, non-parametric model that uh, you can think about. I'm going to show you, obviously, uh, parametric models uh, shortly. Uh, so when you actually implement this probabilistically, it will take you know, a few lines of uh, program. Uh, you can, uh, let me just show you how things may look like. So these are, uh, obviously, three classes here, if I can see the colors correctly. Um, this data, you can see they are not easy to separate linearly. And what I have done here is I am plotting the probability uh, that, uh, so I'm using k equal to 10, so I use 10 neighbors in the KNN algorithm. And then I plot uh, the probability that uh, y is equal to 1, right? Uh, I mean, I am plotting this for every point in this domain. I'm showing you what is the probability that any point belongs to class one. Similarly, here I'm plotting the probability that any point in the domain belongs to class two, okay? And uh, this nice picture on the bottom, it actually plots the map estimate. So effectively, if I compute the posterior of y being to class C, uh, I look at what class gives me the maximum of the posterior, and that's what you see here. So effectively, this is a nice classifier using this KNN uh, algorithm. You can see the separation of the three regions, and obviously the, uh, the boundaries here, they are not linear, so you can, uh, it's, so it's a nonlinear algorithm, and very easy to implement. Again, I don't expect you to understand completely this algorithm, right? But uh, uh, later on when we visit in some detail classification problems, I will disappoint you because effectively I'm going to be going back to this equation because there is nothing really to state beyond that equation. Okay? So the better, uh, the, er the earlier you see this type of uh, uh, equations and an algorithm, the better uh, we will be later on in the, in the, in the course. Okay. Um, now, there is a problem with uh, uh, not just this algorithm, but any algorithm that looks at the neighbors, right? So the first thing you may ask, how do you define a neighbor? Do you use a Euclidean distance? And I would say most of the algorithms use uh, Euclidean distance. Um, and what happens if uh, uh, the dimensionality of the problem is high? So, um, so I mean, obviously in this case, it's two-dimensional problem, so you can actually visualize when you say this training data point is close uh, to a test point. But how about in uh, 10 dimensions or in 20 dimensions? So let me show you what the problem is. And um, in another course, usually I teach a whole uh, two hours long class on the scarce of dimensionality. But let's visit this in the context of uh, this K and N algorithm to show you that we have an issue. So let me start with uh, a unit cube, all right, that somehow has data that are uniformly distributed, okay? So it's a unit cube, every size is one, and has data that they are uniformly distributed, okay? 
So what I want to do is, now the cube here is only in three dimensions, but I want you to imagine the cube in 10 dimensions, 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions. Same idea, OK? So let's do the following thing. Let's find what the size of a smaller cube is that contains a given fraction of the points in the unit cube. So let's say if the unit cube has 1,000 points, and we want 10% you know, uh, of those, what is the size of this little blue cube that contains that fraction that I denote here as f of the points in the unit cube? Now, I'm going to give you the equation, and you can appreciate that the size of the uh, small cube that contains f percentage of the points of the unit cube is f to 1 over d, where d is the dimension. I mean, because the points are uniformly distributed, right? If you multiply f to 1 over d, f 1 over d, d times, you get f. So the fraction of the points in the small cube is f. OK? So let me plot uh, and see why now we have an issue. So let me take that we're interested to find the size of the cube that contains 0.01 of the points in the unit cube, a very small number. So if you are in 10 dimensions, and you go 0 0.01 somewhere there, and you go all the way up, the number that you get is that the size of the small cube is 0 0.63. So even though we are looking for a very small fraction of the points in the unit cube, right, the size of the smaller cube that contains that small fraction is 0.63. So is that little cube a small cube? So you know, if you say you're going to use k nearest neighbor that contains a very small fraction of the total points on the unit cube, then the size of this little cube is going to be 0.63. So do you see any problem? Remember the concept, the k nearest neighbor says k nearest. So if I have a cube of 0.63 in a unit cube of 1, and you take the neighbors in, in uh, 0.63 distance, are those really neighbors? The answer is no. So the higher the dimensionality, right, uh, the uh, higher uh, the size you can see from this plot of this um, uh, small cube that contains f percentage of the total points uh, in the unit cube. So the concept of neighborhood is being lost. So the whole algorithm actually doesn't make any sense uh, in high dimensions. So everybody talks about k nearest neighbor, k nearest neighbor, but if you try to apply it in, uh, in high dimensions, you're actually nothing works. And, and I'm going to tell you the following, that your intuition that you have about Euclidean space, it's actually uh, not a good intuition that is valid in high dimensions. So for example, if 0.0% of the total points in 10 dimensions are contained in a cube uh, that uh, has a size 0.63, where are all the points on this 10-dimensional cube then? Right? So if you put a cube that is of size 0 0.63 and it only contains 0 0.01 of the total number of points of the unit cube, where are all the points that are uniformly distributed on the unit cube? Where are they? Right, obviously, you know, the concept of, you say, uniformly distributed, but now this in 10 dimensions, and there is an issue because you realize this huge cube, it only contains an extremely small fraction of the points. So where are the points? Outside. Outside. No, it cannot be, uh, uh, well, they are outside where? Obviously, they're going to be outside this cube, but in the context of the unit cube, where are they going to be? in the boundary. So, so here is the idea, right? And, uh, 
even if you try to do something uh, uh, in high dimensions, you say, oh, I'm going to do uniform sampling. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense because all the points are on the bound. So why is that it was uniform form distributed? Well, if you, I, even if you take a Gaussian distribution and you do the calculation, you will see the higher the dimension, all right? Remember, it's a distribution, so you are looking. There are two things that you need to think, uh, and maybe we will see this again. One is, where is, let me pose this following. Where is the, the probability mass in high dimensions? Not where the points are, but where is the probability mass? Like, you know, if this is a uniform distribution, you look at 10 dimensions, what is much of the probability mass that you look in 10 dimensions? Okay? So uh, let me leave it there, and um, I may give you a homework uh, problem to work on this in high dimensions, uh, for both for the uniform distribution and for the, the Gaussian distribution as we, uh, we move along. Just remember that your intuition of um, uh, things in, in two and three dimensions is actually not a good intuition in high dimensions, and that's why this uh, problem of Kersel dimensionality it's actually one of the most difficult problems that defines all the complexity in machine learning. I mean, I, I can tell you that annually there must be at least 10 major conferences and workshops on addressing the curse of dimensionality. Okay. Um, now, how do you solve it? This is a problem, right? And uh, even with the K nearest neighbor, you know, Albert, so how do people actually address the cancer dimensionality. So what they do is they make some assumptions about the nature of the data distribution. And that assumption comes uh, in the form of some parametric model. Okay? And this is what is uh, called inductive uh, bias. All right? So you have to make some assumptions to actually be able to address this cancer of dimensionality. Okay? And uh, the easiest way is to assume a parametric model that has a fixed number of parameters, uh, so uh, uh, you can avoid some of the difficulties involved there. Okay, so let me um, give you uh, some examples of parametric models. So uh, we will spend several lectures actually to discuss about uh, uh, Bayesian regression models. And uh, as I mentioned, I think in the previous lecture, more than half of machine learning is supervised learning, that really is regression. So the idea here is uh, we're going to have some training data x. I am going to give you um, uh, y of x. So these data are generated, you know, uh, the y is generated by some unknown function. So we're going to try to approximate that unknown function with something of this form. y of x equals w transpose x. Uh, you can see if x is d-dimensional, so this is the simplest way. And then because the data may be noisy, we're going to put some Gaussian noise as well there. So this model is a parametric model. It has d parameters, all right? It doesn't matter how many training data, if you have a million or a billion, it still has only d parameters. And uh, so it would be sort of one of the most trivial models uh, to work on. And you can actually write this model probabilistically if you assume that the noise is Gaussian, and probabilistically, I want you to look at it because we will come back on this on, uh, for many lectures now. Uh, probabilistically, I can write the equation that you see on the top as follows. Right? It says the probability of y given x and some model parameters that I'm going to define is a Gaussian. Where is the Gaussian coming? Because I'm going to assume that this noise is Gaussian. Right? So it's going to be a Gaussian. What the mean of the Gaussian is if you make this standard normal, if you make epsilon to have a mean zero, then this is the mean of the Gaussian. All right, so this is what I have here. And then uh, you have some um, uh, noise uh, from that uh, uh, error epsilon that I call it here sigma square. Now, I don't know if it was uh, um, um, you know, out of uh, uh, typing error or uh, I was too enthusiastic, I put that the noise there is a function of x. So when you do predictions are given x, I make this noise to be a function of x. 
but actually this makes the model rather difficult to work on. So if the noise is a function of x, this is what they call heteroscedastic models. So right now, assume that somehow this noise is constant. So the parameters that I have in my model are the parameters w, all right, and some constant noise uh, sigma squared. And I call those parameters theta. Okay? So a simple regression problem again is uh, the response at any x is a Gaussian. Uh, you make them in to be some linear function uh, uh, in this particular case of x. Actually, it's better to look at this as a linear function in w. That's why we call this a linear regression uh, uh, model. Uh, I'm going to correct. Uh, I'm going to show you something uh, more interesting in the next slide, I think. But I make the mean to be w transpose x. And sigma squared and w are the unknown parameters. So, um, and we already have seen, you know, fitting a straight line, uh, fitting perfectly the data, so having an overfitting uh, situation. So we will visit all of these things and see how actually we go about to select uh, uh, the, the model parameters uh, uh, to be sure that we have some predictive capability for this, for this model. Now, let me, uh, I actually see what I wanted to say before. So you remember the mean that I had here? It was W transpose X. Actually, what is typical in machine learning, that X, what you can do is you can actually do some pre-processing and map X to another space, phi of X. All right? And phi of X can be uh, polynomials, can be kernel functions like Gaussians, can be neural networks. I can map X to phi of X. So in essence, the model is not linear in X, but I actually still call it a linear model because the statisticians call this a linear model because it's linear in W, right? But in X can be anything. I can use some, you know, uh, any functions you want in X, okay? Uh, so this is obviously more powerful because effectively you are saying there must be some future space phi of X all right, some future space phi of x, where this model will behave better, so your mean function is w transpose phi. And actually, way later in the course, near the end, we will uh, see uh, on how to adaptively select even the functions phi of x. So rather than pre-assuming what they are, uh, we're going to try to learn them. And by the way, you know, for those who work on uh, deep learning, uh, the idea there is you're actually learn these functions rather than assuming what they are. Okay? But mathematically, that's how the model looks like. So there's no, you know, you're not losing anything by, you know, if it's a neural network or support vector machines or whatever, this is your model. That's it. Trivial. Okay, and if you want to plot this probability, so, you know, uh, obviously here, you know, it looks like you're fitting a straight line, but you notice if I plot actually the probability, it does give you uh, some mean of this Gaussian and then it drops fast, right? Uh, so this is a much better representation uh, that follows this equation that you see here, okay? So the mean is a straight line, okay? And, uh, uh, and then it drops off with some variance sigma squared. All right. Uh, remember that uh, all of these simple ideas are only an introduction to tell you what type of problems we will do. So we will revisit all of these problems in detail. That it will take something that looks extremely simple, like this model, and we're going to make it extremely difficult. Because obviously, not all data live in two dimensions, right? Or in one dimension, here x, right? So this model may not be the best. So we have to see how we can generalize these ideas, and we will do this when we talk about uh, supervised learning. So, but let me give you another example of a parametric model for regression. So we think of a very simple problem. I give you some training data, and the training data basically belongs to two classes. 
And in this particular case, I think, uh, let me see, these are the, let me just put everything up, right? So these are the SAT scores, all right? And you notice, um, so these are training data sets, all right? Training data sets and uh, more training data sets. And uh, all of the students here pass the exam. Uh, and all of the students here uh, fail the exam. Okay? So this is like class one, all of the students pass the exam, and this is class zero, all the students fail the exam. So the classification problem is, uh, do, if I give you some grade of some student, so if I give you a grade of 560, you have to tell me if the student with 560 passes the exam or not. Okay? So the way we do this, similar to regression, uh, using a parametric model. So for every x, we want to know if that particular student with a grade x belongs to class y equal to 1, which means he passed the exam, or y equal to 0. So a good way to actually fit a probability that says either he passes the exam or not is to actually use a Bernoulli distribution. So what in, uh, for those who remember the Bernoulli distribution, mu of x is the probability of passing the exam. And 1 minus mu is the probability of failing the exam. So actually, can somebody remind me what this distribution look like? Remember that y takes the value 1 and 0. So what is this Bernoulli distribution looks like? Would be mu to a power y. 1 minus mu to the power 1 minus y. Why is that? Because if y equal to 1, what term stays there? Only the mu term, which is the probability of passing the exam. All right. So this probability for classification problems is directly modeled with a Bernoulli distribution. The question is now, how do we make a parametric model uh, for this uh, mu of x? So mu of x is the probability of the student with a grade x passing the exam. How do you make a probability model? So you need, first, you know, we only know about linear type of models, right? So we're going to, to use x and multiply with the W transpose, all right? Uh, exactly the same way we did with regression. But if you multiply W transpose with x, you don't get a probability. Right? Probability is between 0 and 1. So how do you take something and transform it to another variable that is between 0 and 1? So what do you need to do to some variable x to transform it to another variable between 0 and 1? What is that nice function there? it again. The, uh, well, it is uh, 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 pronouncing is very important. Because if you tell me it is SIGM, I will have no idea what you're talking. So what function is that? You should know it because it is everywhere. And I told you when you need it, right? When you need to transform something from any value to a value between 0 and 1, you want to make it a probability. You can see this function. That's this SIGM function. So what's the name of it? Sigmoid. That's the sigmoid function. All right, so that's the sigmoid function. OK? And I want you to remember the definition of the sigmoid function that you see up there. OK, we're done. If we want a parametric model for classification, uh, what we do is we fit to this probability a Bernoulli distribution. And we take the mean to be the sigmoid of W transpose x. That's it. And how do you call this model? You call it a logistic regression model. We're going to spend a whole lecture on it. And actually, when we spend a whole lecture, you're going to tell me what is new from what you told us in the introductory lecture. The answer is going to be nothing. The rest is little noise and little algebra here and there, right? Uh, but the idea here is uh, now. This is not regression, so the name is a little bit misleading, okay? It's a classification model, but we call it logistic regression. So you fit a probability 
for every x for the y, and uh, when where is your decision boundary? You say, you know what, uh, the student passes if this probability is greater than 0.5, all right? And you can see where the 0.5 is from the sigmoid function is there. So here is the classification bound. Okay, and uh, you notice interestingly enough that the error that you do in the training data set is not zero. Can you see that? Because for example, this student passed the exam, but now the prediction is that he failed. So even in the training data set, your um, prediction is not correct. And the reason for that is, can somebody look at the diagram and say what is the reason that even in the training data set you do a mistake? Let me just remind you, they were for the same grade, there were two students, one passed, one failed. You may say, well, why is that uh, possible? Well, because the professor liked this student, didn't like that student. All right, so this passed, this failed. But what does it mean for the algorithm if in the training data set this passes and this fails in the same grade? Can you imagine a separation boundary that somehow linearly separates the data? The, the answer is no, you cannot linearly separate the data. And this is why uh, the uh, misclassification error on the training data set is not zero. By the way, literally with what I told you, you should be able to program this because it, will, uh, it takes only uh, a few lines. All the information is on this slide. And uh, the good news is you don't have to program it because if you search, you will find about 10 million uh, different implementations of this uh, in different platforms. Uh, all right, so uh, let me go back to the non-parametric models, right? We talked that uh, uh, the k equal to 1 is a very complex model. So when you use one nearest neighbor, uh, the, uh, you do errors even in the training data set, OK? I'm sorry, you do zero error in the training data set. So you basically overfit, OK? That's the idea here. Um, and the prediction that you do is very weakly, OK? So you can see here in the k nearest neighbor, you can see the uh, boundaries, the separation boundaries are uh, very weakly. They're all over the place. Now, if you use k equal to 5, the separation boundaries are more smooth, right? So the separation boundaries are more smooth. Um, so as k increases, the model becomes simpler, all right? When k equal to 1, the model is complex. And I already mentioned the Occam uh, uh, razor uh, principle that says that most probably the best model to fit the data in this case is the simplest one. The question is, however, how do you select how many neighbors to use in this algorithm? Obviously, with this, you overfit zero error in the training data. But do you think the predictive capability of this algorithm is correct? So in other ways, if you try to test it in uh, uh, test data sets, what do you think? Uh, will the error be small? What do you think? So the error will be big. And, and let me show you a plot, OK? Um, the zero that you see here on capital K is supposed to be 1, OK? This is just came like that from plotting. Uh, but if you look, let's look first at the training data set. So for k equal to 1, we said that the training error is 0. And um, if you actually continue and you increase to k equal to 2, k equal to 3, etc., there is a plateau of the error. And then at, for k greater than 100, the error starts blowing up. Now, if you look at the test error, for k equal to 1 is the biggest, then it drops, then there is a plateau, and then after k 100, it starts increasing again. So looking at this plot, if you do a plot like this for the training and test data sets, can you tell me what capital K will be reasonable? Or what case will you use if you have a, uh, a plot like that? What will be reasonable case to use in this case? 
Obviously, cannot use k equal to 1 because the test error is huge. Cannot use k greater than 100 because both errors blowing up. So in principle, anything in between k, let's say, equal to 2 and k equal to 100, it's OK. And you may say, you know, this is not much of a choice, right? Uh, anything is fine. You know, that's good. Actually, you know, I would be more concerned if there is only a very precise value of k that makes this thing to work. The fact here that you can get reasonable results for a range of k, to me, that's good. Right? And it goes in line with what I know about uh, regularization method square. Uh, not a single parameter does the job, but a range of parameters is, is uh, good enough for, uh, for doing the job. And by the way, the, uh, the uh, misclassification error, uh, again, I define it in a very simple, this is for the training data set. I am using my indicator function. Right? So f of xi is what my classifier predicts. So this, if it is not uh, coincide with uh, the labels yi that I gave to the model, uh, uh, will give a mis misclassified point. So the percentage of misclassified points is the error that I do in the training data set. All right. Now, Talking about, uh, so we plotted the, the test error and the training, the error of the training data set. Uh, the uh, non Bayesians uh, in machine learning, uh, one of the techniques they use to actually, um, uh, you know, uh, select the, uh, evaluate the performance of the model is what is called cross validation. Okay? Now, it's very possible that if you submit a paper somewhere, they may expect, you, even if your paper is fully Bayesian, they may expect you to do, to do cross-validation, but really, uh, Bayesian statisticians don't like cross-validation, all right? And, and I will explain to you after I give you what this is all about. So what is the idea of cross-validation? If you have a number of, uh, uh, if you have a data set, okay? Uh, so this is my whole data set. You split it in five pieces, and then uh, you actually train the model in four of these pieces together, and then you do predictions on the last uh, uh, portion of the data set, this red portion, and you repeat this when the red is here, there, 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 and there, and then you average the, the, uh, the error that you do. Okay? This is what's called cross-validation. and. Uh, and so in this particular case, if uh, k is equal to 5, is a five-fold uh, uh, cross-validation. If you have n data, all right, and you partition it in n pieces, you get an algorithm that is called how. So if I have n data and I partition it in n pieces, what's the name of the algorithm for cross-validation? Leave one out, all right? So that's the leave one out um, uh, cross-validation. Um, and um, so effectively, you're using all the points but one, all right? So you do uh, compute the error for that uh, point that you left out, and then you repeat for the next point being left out, and then you average. Now, why Bayesians don't like this? Because in a Bayesian uh, thinking, if I give you data, you have to use all of it, all right? Because the more the data, the better your predictions. So you cannot waste data to split it in pieces and do cross-validation. But still, um, lots of people are not Bayesian, all right? And uh, a lot of techniques, like in deep learning, uh, it's just there's nothing necessarily probabilistic there. So uh, using ideas of cross-validation is still uh, uh, rather, I would say, the norm. All right, so let me just finish and, uh, uh, for the introduction. And uh, so we said we have parametric models, non-parametric models. We saw some examples. And uh, so the question is, uh, the performance of every model right, depends on what data you have. 
So in other ways, I can give you a data set for something like linear regression as maybe the best model, and you are thrilled. Then I'm thrown to you another data set, nothing works. So the bottom line here is, if something works for one data set, do not assume that's actually a good algorithm. OK? So uh, effectively, uh, the, the complexity of the different data sets that can be given to you is significant, OK? And it varies. So effectively, there is no such a thing as, you know, if you ask somebody, what is the best algorithm for regression today in high dimensions? There's no answer to that. OK? It is, you know, you can find the best algorithm for the data sets you have for the task you have. Yeah, and I can believe you, but you have to be realistic that if I give you another task, a regression task with another data set, maybe your, result, your methodology would not be very good. So the idea here is, uh, this is the no free lunch uh, theorem that has a lot of different in, uh, interpretations. Uh, so there is no such a thing as a universal algorithm that does well on all possible data sets uh, that you have at hand. Um, now, obviously, uh, you know, uh, and we will see this, right, even in a regression model, uh, you know, we have to compute, let's say, the parameters W. Is there any unique way to actually train the model? The answer is no. I don't have time to do this today. We will do this tomorrow. And tomorrow what we will do is to compute actually the predictive distribution, all right? So if I gave you some training data, can you tell me what other numbers maybe are coming from the same concept, OK? And that will require to compute the predictive distribution. And the predictive distribution will be an integral of the likelihood under each hypothesis h times the posterior of h.